welcome to our next session at uh, Samvad at ZJLF 2019. Um, this is going to be a fascinating session. I'm really looking forward to it. We have uh, a very distinguished panel, a very distinguished panelists. Um, please do not block the aisles. No, no you cannot sit there. There's more, there's more room over on the side there. But from the back, yes, please. Um, excuse me, can you? Yeah, please sp keep some space for them to, the authors to come through. Sorry, we just gotta clear some space for you to come through over there. Please, excuse me, on the side over there, please. But yeah. Side, please stand on the side. Okay, um, we do, I do want to get started. I know we're all very keen, eager to get this uh, session started, so please, please keep the aisles clear and um, squeeze in as much as you can. Um, I know this is a session that everybody wants to listen to. Um, so our next session, Multiple Histories, uh, Islam must multiple history, sorry, presented by the Institute of Ismaili Studies and Aga Khan Foundation. Uh, please welcome our very distinguished panel, writer and historian uh, Rana Safvi, former Minister of External Affairs, Law and Justice and Corporate Affairs, Salman Kurshid, historian and anthropologist and co-author of Islam and his Illustrated History, Zulfikar Hirji, in conversation with Max Rodenbeck, South Asia Bureau Chief for The Economist. Big round of applause, please. Hello, everyone. Um, I don't know how many of you saw the last session, but uh, it is the proverbial hard act to follow. Um, it was a magic show, so I don't know if we'll live up to that standard, but uh, we'll try and keep you entertained, and uh, we are actually starting off with some beautiful pictures, which is nice. Um, and I'll just briefly say something more in introduction about our, our panelists. Uh, um, we have Salman Khurshid, who's uh, an extremely distinguished everything. I mean, you, you are a diplomat, a lawyer, possibly a magician too, uh, <laughs> writer of books, uh, Congresswala, and uh, also the father to uh, something like 100 cats and 70 dogs, I gather. Yeah, something like sure. that. That's quite, that's quite enough things to keep you occupied. <laughs> and uh, Rana Safvi, who's, who's an authority on, on Del the city of Delhi and the history of Delhi and the monuments of Delhi, and who's written several books about that, and recently a book uh, about the uh, s stories from, from the Islamic uh, tradition. Uh, and uh, Zulfikar Hirji, who is uh, the author of several books also, uh, and a professor of anthropology, in fact. Um, but he's got a very beautiful book to present, and I won't stop him from doing so. We'll plunge right into that. So please do go forward and, and present your book. I have a big sign here that says, breathe. <laughs> um, it's my great pleasure to be here at the Jaipur Literary Festival, and I'm very sorry that my co-author, Dr. Farhad Daftari, isn't here with us uh, this afternoon, but he sends his greetings. Um, this book was produced um, in commemoration of the Diamond Jubilee of His Highness the Aga Khan, and it's a great honor for me to have been commissioned to uh, write this book, um, which really um, I thought I would share some of the images, themes, and stories that uh, are in it, and hope that it will entice you enough to at least go and have a look at it in the bookstore. That's a plug, um, if there are any left. Okay, uh, just to start off then, um, I'll just turn to the slides, um, and hopefully this will uh, function. Uh, I'm not sure where to point it, but, oh, there we are. Okay, perfect. Okay, uh, the book begins by locating Islam's emergence against the backdrop of late antiquity, a time period stretching from the third to the eighth century. Now, this was a period when Judaism and Christianity 
The two Abrahamic and monotheistic traditions of the Mediterranean and the Middle East were on the ascent. And when Christianity, after centuries of persecution, became the official religion of the Roman Empire under Constantine the Great, and whose colossal marble bust you can see on, I guess it would be your uh, far left of the screen here. Now, toward the end of the late antique period, the seat of Christianity's most dominant tradition, known as Byzantine Christianity, and then later the Eastern Orthodox Church, was located in Constantinople in today's Istanbul. The rulers of the Byzantine uh, tradition continuously sought to protect and extend their power further into the Middle East. And here they vied with the ancient, vast, and powerful Persian Empire that had its own sort of uh, dualistic religious tradition, which you all know of as Zoroastrianism. Now, at this critical moment, uh, in this kind of melee uh, in the seventh century, Arabia, the place where Islam would soon emerge, was not a backwater. Um, historians have often claimed this to be the case, but new scholarship is suggesting otherwise. Arabia was a dynamic and pluralistic society, and it had a range of uh, socio-political uh, trade relations and commercial ties, philosophical ties, intellectual ties, both to the east and west, as well as to the south. And Arabia's northern and southern regions were home to a variety of uh, Jews and Christians, as well as many other local religious groups. And the image on the far right of the screen shows you a rock cut carving of Dushara, the eagle god of the Nabataeans, who were the Arabian Nabataeans. And this uh, particular uh, sculpture is mounted on the facade of a second century tomb in Madain Saleh, which is located in today's Saudi Arabia. So really the point I'm trying to make here in this sort of introduction is that the uh, context into which Islam emerges, this religious and political context, uh, was extremely complex. And it's in this milieu, in this context, in which the early Muslims first established and began to think about their foundations. Uh, let me just see if it's going to go forward. Ah, there we go. Uh, the book then takes the reader through the foundational history of Islam, particularly focusing on the life of the Holy Prophet Muhammad and the development of the revelation of the Quran as an oral and a written tradition. And it, of course, had multiple interpretations. The book also depicts some of the arts that the Quran has inspired, and the images on the screen show some of the ways in which the Quran has been presented. Here you see from the far left a 7th century Quran page discovered in the great mosque of Sana'a in Yemen, an 18th century red colored Turkish cenotaph covering with Quranic inscriptions, a group of students in Mali, West Africa, practicing calligraphy at a Quran school just a few years ago, the earliest monumental inscription of a Quranic verse in Jerusalem's 7th century Dome of the Rock, a 12th century mosque lamp from Egypt painted with the enigmatic verse of light from the Quran, and a contemporary neon artwork with the word Allah by the Saudi Arabian artist Nasser al Salam. Now these are just a few examples you'll find in the book of the many diverse ways in which Muslims have sought to preserve and express what they believe to be God's revelation to humankind. So following this foundational history, the book takes up a dynastic framework to discuss the more than 1400 year development of Islam from the shores of the Atlantic down to South, Southeast Asia as well as covering Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, the Middle East and other places. It also deals with um, Europe uh, where Islam of course uh, was present. Now all these chapters cover the major political dynasties that emerged after the death of the Holy Prophet and his immediate successors including the Umayyads, the Abbasids, Fatimids, Safavids, the Mughals, of course, and Ottomans, as well as many of Islam's interpretative communities, including the Sunni, Shia, Ibadi, and Sufi traditions. The geographical scope of the book, as well as the inclusion of these different interpretive traditions into a single sort of historical narrative, is, uh, in my humble view, somewhat unique amongst the many general books on Islam that you might find. Many of these uh, uh, books tend to locate Islam primarily in the Middle East as a kind of a, uh, a Middle Eastern phenomena, or adopt one Islamic interpretive tradition as wholly representative of an entire faith. And this book doesn't do that. 
uh, it takes this kind of inclusive approach, trying to uh, share with the reader all the different perspectives that have gone into uh, the tradition over many, many centuries. The book is not intended to be comprehensive, and it's not encyclopedic. Its aim is to inform the reader that there have been many different individuals, groups, and communities who have contributed to the development and understanding of the Islamic tradition, and they continue to do so. All right, the concluding chapter of the book focuses on Islam and Muslims in the modern period from the 19th century up to the present day and depicts a variety of architecture from that period. Now, the group of colorful buildings you see on the left of the screen are examples of the so-called Indo-Saracenic, neo moresque or neo-Islamic buildings. This is a style of architecture that eclectically borrowed elements from diverse historic Muslim building traditions and became quite fashionable, um, especially at the be beginning of the 20th century in Europe and North America. The image shows, for example, the white dome of the Brighton Pavilion, as well as a, uh, which is a royal residence in England, and the interior of a synagogue in New York City. So you can see that not all buildings that have this style, uh, this, this neo-Islamic style, were produced by Muslims, but they were adopted into other traditions. I want to then, in the you know, few minutes that I have, just talk about some of the themes and stories. Uh, oops, I went too far. Yes, there we go. Um, that are in the book. The first one I want to just mention is about these cultural encounters uh, through conquest, trade, and travel. So the book is based on this metaphor of a journey, and it would be important to then show the ways in which Islam spread and took root in different geographical and cultural contexts. Of course, military conquest was an important part of this historical process. For example, by the 8th century, the Umayyad Caliphate had expanded its political territory to the shores of the Indus, which at the time was home to a range of different Buddhist, Buddhist communities. The book also discusses the itineraries of famous Muslim travelers, such as Ibn Battuta, a 14th century North African whose surviving travelogues produce provide a rare glimpse into the diverse local traditions and practices of Muslims and non-Muslims, and tell us a lot about the places he visited. And in order to explore and expand their trading networks, Muslims from different cultural traditions invented and perfected navigational and scientific instruments and technologies, such as the astrolabe and star charts shown on the image on the right. Now, this is my favorite part of the book, actually. Um, it's about women's contributions. The contributions of Muslim women to Islamic civilization is an important theme in the book, and to the extent possible and based on available scholarship, the book provides examples of how Muslim women served as rulers, patrons of society and the arts, intellectuals, as well as the carers of tradition. And in the case of the Fatimid dynasty, for example, quite a number of the dynasty's wives, daughters, um, and mothers were prodigious patrons who spent their independently held wealth on endowing buildings and supporting other civic causes. The portrait shown in the center here is painted by the 17th century Italian artist, Cristofano del Altissimo, and it's of Mehrama Sultan, the daughter of the Ottoman Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent and his wife, Roxelana. Now, Roxelana and uh, Merham Sultan were, like many other women of the Ottoman court, they were known for their enlightened social engagement and political acumen, which were so critical to Ottoman statecraft, longevity, wealth, and international relations. The book also contains some portraits of groups and individuals from Islamic history whose lives and contributions are very rarely covered in general books on Islam. The chapter on the Quran, for example, depicts a 1734 portrait of a man named Ayuba Suleiman Diallo, and here he's painted on the very left-hand side by <clears throat> the British painter William Hoare. Diallo was a West African Senegalese man who was captured and taken to America as a slave. And through enterprise and fortune, he eventually escaped to England where his story became well known and he received his freedom. Unfortunately, when he returned to his homeland, he was again imprisoned by the French in West Africa and there he, he died there. Another figure shown in the book is of a sultan of the Sidi dynasty of Gujarat. The Sidis are thought to have been of slave origin, captured from East Africa and brought to India. Some members of the Sidi community rose in rank in Gujarat's Muslim courts, particularly during the 14th century under the Muzaffarids. 
These type of micro histories are an increasingly important part of an emerging scholarly study, and their inclusion in this book are meant to signal new avenues of inquiry and challenge conventional frameworks and grand narratives which are often used to write about Islamic history, and it's a subject I'm hoping that we will take up during the panel discussion. The book also explores stories of Islam's ongoing contributions to world culture, and particularly Islam's contacts with the West. And I've highlighted three here, tulips, coffee, and silk. And while I let you explore these for yourself when you hopefully buy the book, or at least have a chance to look at it, I wanted to draw your attention to the touching portrait of the couple on the left, painted by the 17th century Dutch painter Michael Jans. Now, tulip bulbs, if you know the story, were imported into Holland from the Ottoman realms. And they came into the Ottoman Empire actually from Persia. And in the Ottoman realms, the tulips had this amazing symbolic sub significance. And they became, in fact, known, for example, uh, uh, to represent the blood of martyrs. When they arrived in Holland in the 17th century, tulips became a high price commodity. And by the 1630s, tulip bulbs were exchanged for as much as 4,500 guilders, a price equivalent to a large Jaipur Haveli, I think. Um, the tulip is in this, portrait, in this portrait alludes to the couple's wealth. Uh, perhaps commissioned by the husband after the death of his wife, the tulip here is also a symbol of frailty and decay. Life is born out of the bulb, flowers into the tulip, but eventually must die. And that leads me to the final set of themes in the book. Stories of survival, search for the divine, and diverse cultural expressions. And here are the stories of Muslim communities who survived the attacks of the Mongols in the 13th century, as well as the seekers of the divine and believers in the eternal, who preserved their legacies and love in the form of artistic expressions and architectural monuments, like the very famous Taj Mahal, a building you all know very well, which was erected in the 17th century by the Mughal Emperor, Emperor Shah Jahan for his beloved wife, Mumtaz. Finally, throughout the book, we have included examples of the multiple and diverse ways in which Muslims have expressed their existential concerns and spiritual understandings. These include visual art, material culture, architecture, gardens, manuscripts, and book culture, as well as literary works. And it is fitting then at this most most amazing literary festival, I conclude with a verse from the Persian Muslim poet Saadi, who in the midst of the 13th century Mongol, Mongol invasions, wrote this poem for his, from his safe haven in the city of Shiraz. All human beings are members of one frame, since all at first from the same essence came. When time affects a limb with pain, the other limbs at rest cannot remain. If thou feel not for the other's misery, a human being is no name for thee. Thanks. Thanks very much, Zulfikar. Uh, another very hard act to follow. I'm not sure if I can follow the, uh, you know, if I can follow up on the poetry of Saadi. Um, but I, I'd like to just um, open up a couple of broad themes as we go on. We'll, we'll speak for about half an hour, something like that, uh, and uh, give everyone a chance to talk here. And then, then we'll open up to some questions from, from, from the audience. Um, one, one of the broad themes that, that this book, which covers such an extraordinary scope, um, in time and uh, space and also in, in sort of profundity um, uh, is, a, is a question of whether we should really be talking about one Islam or many Islams. Maybe it should be a plural word. Uh, and I'm not saying this because I'm advocating this. I just, w I'm tossing this up as a question. And I wonder if I, can I start with you, Salman? Would you, would you, would you, have, an, uh, would you have an answer to that? Is it just, is there one Islam or are we talking about many things? Uh, that's the, the kind of question that gets you into trouble. Uh, great trouble. But your lawyers are uh, supposed but, to handle uh, those kinds of questions, me, though. Let, let me just say, if I can, if I can put it right, um, there is a single concept. The concept of Islam is is one and single. And I think, I think anyone who wants to understand Islam, that is very, very critical. But they can be, and I believe they are. And I think this book is a is an ideal il illustration of that. Um, there are many conceptions, because. Uh, there is a core uh, Islam theology, and then there are many uh, frills, as it were. There are cultural frills that get added on to Islam, and that depends on uh, the locale 
that depends on the community, that depends on a lot to do with, with uh, subcultures and cultures, etc. And, uh, and therefore, it would not be wrong to say Indian Islam is, is dramatically different from Islam that we know um, in, in uh, West Asia, for instance, uh, in many, many ways. Indian Islam, of course, is, is greatly influenced by, uh, by other religions of, of our land. Uh, and in that sense, Islam uh, here may be very different from Islam elsewhere. So in, in that sense, what we know as Wahhabism today is something that it would, would be very different from the Sufi Islam that we understand, and then the shades that would come in between. So I would say the concept and the basic belief is the same everywhere, and very, very specifically same everywhere. But it's understanding, interpretations, conceptions and presentations may be quite different. Ran, if I might just ask you to move add to that theme. Just before, before uh, the session, you were, you were mentioning uh, that there has been a rather sort of male-dominated version of the origins of Islam, that, that, uh, 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 and there are actually other interpretations of the history. I mean, would, would you care to address, address that? See, I'd like to add to that by saying there is one Islam, but many Muslims. And e uh, each community of Muslim has their own concept, as Salman Saab said, of what Islam should be. But Islam remains one, and that is uh, you know, one God, and uh, that prof uh, Prophet Muhammad is the last prophet. That is the essence of Islam. Now, Islam, when it came, uh, as um, many of you may be knowing, because we celebrate this every year in Ramadan, uh, the Prophet had a revelation in the month of Ramadan while he was meditating in a cave in the Mount of Hira, Jabal Hira. And uh, there when he, it's a small cave, he's meditating there, he used to meditate there for many years on end. And then suddenly the uh, angel Gabriel appears there and he says, Ikra, read. And he repeats it a number of times and the prophet is shivering, he doesn't know what's happened. And uh, after that he, the, he tries to run from there and uh, the angel says that you are the prophet of Islam. He comes home to his wife Khadija. Now Khadija used to be his boss. He was her manager. She was a very successful, one of the most successful business people of Mecca. I won't say woman because there were, she was as successful as the men and she employed him. He was 15 years her younger and she proposed to him because she liked his character. She liked the way he uh, conducted himself and she proposed to him. He got married to her. He shifted into her house and when this uh, revelation came to him, he came running down to her thinking that he had gone Ma crazy. He thought, you know, this was Junoon. And uh, she comforts him and says, no, go, you have been a very good and a devoted man. Why would God test you like this? And she comforts him. She wraps him up in a blanket and a surah on that is there in the Quran called Surah Muzammal. And then she, you know, like she helps him to come to terms with the fact that yes, he ha is the chosen one who has been chosen as the prophet of God and the last messenger uh, or the last prophet. So this is where Islam is coming from. But today, if you talk to any, uh, I won't say any, but in a majority of places, like you go to a mosque, they'll tell you, please stay aside. This is only for men. So she was the first to convert to Islam. And the one who was, her money was used to propagate Islam. But that is not what, as I said, we, there are Muslims and there is Islam. But could we say then that uh, Muhammad may have been the director, but she was the producer? <laughs> She was definitely the one behind him. <laughs> the one who supported him to go ahead with his uh, prophethood. Zulfikar, would you like to address the question of one Islam or many Islams? I'll address it by saying that that's an essay question for my students on their <laughs> exam, on their test. And the reason why I say that is because it's a question um, that is, uh, let me do it by this saying this. There are three other uh, questions that you might ask in addition to that question. And I can't I'm, I'm taking notes to ask them <laughs> next. So, uh, as an anthropologist, this is a perennial question on people on, who study this subject. So there was a proposition by a very famous scholar who studied um, in uh, North Africa, and he, his name was Ernst Gellner, and he put forward the idea as Islam is the blueprint of the social order. And that was meant to say that there is this blueprint out there, and Muslims just um, take that blueprint and follow it. Then there was this proposition of uh, a scholar named Michael Gilsenin, and Gilsenin who said that Islam is what people say it is, which is the Islam, is, there is one Islam, there are many Islams. 
But there's also a third proposition is that uh, put forward by a man named Talal Assad, um, who said that Islam is a discursive tradition. It's uh, based on some foundational um, principles uh, and texts and uh, conversations, which Muslims use this treasure to reconfigure themselves within the context that they're living. Um, and so you don't have to have this many Islams, one Islam debate. M Islam, is, as Muslims live it and think about it, is, 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 is based on some uh, foundational material. Now, the criticism of Talal Assad is exactly what Rana has said, is that but the vast majority of discourse has been held, or at least been said to be held, by men. And so this is one of the issues that um, is being raised now. Uh, how do you think about this discourse, and who can participate in that discourse? So I'll just leave that as your uh, essay question <laughs> to think about what, what, how do we Im imagine this, uh, this space. But I couldn't answer it definitively in the way that you've put it. I think you've answered very beautifully, though. Um, and I mean, uh, I, I think, and it's, I think it's a very much a truism that, like any faith, Islam is actually evolving. It's not something that's fixed. It actually changes over time. As, and this is something that your 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 your, your book has pointed out. There's something else I want to ask Zulfikar before moving back to the other panelists. Uh, I mean, in doing a book like this, it must be so difficult to know, to choose what to leave out. I mean, that must be as difficult as to know what to include. Uh, how, how did you make up, how did you decide what to leave out? Well, the publisher basically said you have 344 pages and not a page more. That's a very good motivation for not being able to include everything. Uh, yes, it is selective. And all, like all narratives uh, of any type, um, you are constrained by the format, the size, and all those things. But I think in this book, we, um, we set out to uh, exemplify uh, a variety of different approaches to Islam and create one narrative. And that did mean that we had to leave many, many, many stories out. Uh, and it's, it's hard for me to say, um, I can show you the cutting room floor where there are pages that we didn't use and stories that I didn't write. And uh, my editor, um, who's in the room here, can tell you about those uh, hard choices, very, very difficult choices, and pictures that we didn't use. Uh, but I think what's most interesting is that what we did choose to include you may not find in other such works. So that was one of our motivating factors in making the choices. There is a broad set of knowledge out there. So to, for example, to include, include someone, um, a, a portrait of a sultan from the Sidi community who was part of the Muzaffarid dynasty, I mean, it would, would seem obscure in some ways. But imagine, for example, thinking about Islam from Jaipur writing the history of Islam as if Jaipur was the center of the world, or thinking about it from the point of view if, uh, if um, you know, uh, Mumbai was the center of the world. I think that's the kind of um, way in which historians are thinking about now, is that we have tended to choose material as if there was an origin, a center, and now with our sort of multi-centered world, I think we're starting to think about history slightly different, and that's what I'm hoping that the book will provoke. I can remember seeing a very wonderful map of the world by a, I think, 11th century Muslim a cartographer, El Idrisi, which actually shows the world, as we know it, upside down with Mecca in the middle. Uh, so it's, it's just a different perspective on things. Um, I wanted to move on to another broad theme, which is the, the question, and it's something that, that, that's faced very much by Muslims today, but has, has been a problem in Islam forever. Uh, which is the question of who, who speaks for Islam? I mean, who speaks for Muslims? Who speaks for Islam? There are a lot of voices, and this is a particular problem, I think, in, in India, actually, where, where uh, you have a very large Muslim community, uh, but an extremely diverse Muslim community. And there's a real question, it's not just a question of political representation, but who speaks for Islam? And I wonder, I mean, you don't, don't need to go into a great lecture, uh, 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 Salman, but, but I wonder if you can address that question. Uh, how, how do Muslims a, resolve that? Well, in Hindu philosophy, uh, there is an interesting way of, of approaching uh, the world, uh, which is to say, it's not this, not this, and not this, neti, neti, neti. Um, I think it's very difficult in, in a society like ours uh, to be able to pinpoint and say uh, so-and-so speaks for, for Islam, or indeed so-and-so speaks for Muslims. Uh, they, we've been through a traumatic experience of the sole spokesperson, which is Muhammad Ali Jinnah, 
uh, repudiated and rejected by a whole, whole large number of Muslims in India. Um, and uh, I thought we'd repudiated him once permanently, but some people think that we need to repudiate him again and again. But that's another, that's another matter. The, uh, the, problem, the, problem is, the, the problem is that there is a divine element in Islam, and there is another element which is uh, interpretive. Um, ishtihad, for instance. And uh, the big question that uh, the doors of Ishtihad are not closed forever. Now, is it the four Imams only who could have, who could have participated in Ishtihad, or can it be done now, today? And I think in modern contemporary uh, societies, there is great need for a serious look at Ishtihad to interpret Islam in terms of modern challenges. But the difficulty is, who does the interpretation? How do you accept the interpretation? Now, in India, you have the personal law board. A lot of people accept it. A lot of people don't accept it. Then you have the Supreme Court. A lot of people, of course, obviously accept the Supreme Court. But a lot of people have problems to say that the Supreme Court is not equipped to, to tell you what is the true uh, and the core, or core, of, core of Islam. So we, we work on it in a, in a kind of a democratic way that you, uh, you accept your leaders partly spiritual, partly political, to show you the path. But ultimately, I think, a Muslim has to look, will look within, uh, not necessarily a look to a priest, but a look, look to within. But I guess that you need to have some understanding in order to be, look, to be able to look within. And last, lastly, I believe, in, in a country like India, uh, you have this remarkable, remarkable uh, uh, coming together of uh, Sufism with many traditions, Indian traditions from other religions, and that just offers a new dimension entirely. I mean, is it possible that maybe no one should try to speak for Islam and just Muslims should speak for Islam in general? Is that, is that an answer? Rana, what do you think? Uh, I would s s think that yes, and as Salman Saab said, you have to look within. It is ultimately, your, you are answerable to yourself, and it's between you and God, and that is how uh, Islam has been perceived. And uh, there were never was a middleman in Islam. So we have to be, uh, and we have to, but for that, we have to have knowledge, and we have to have people who can impart that knowledge to us. And uh, we used to have the Sufis. Uh, nowadays, we have the Dargahs, the Sufi saints themselves are no longer there. And, uh, but people do go there, and there are some practitioners there who do tell you. But uh, Sufism was something that was very, very special to India. And uh, that tradition of now what we have is people going to dargahs and uh, asking and praying at the shrines. But the Sufi saint who used to sit and give discourses like say Hazrat Nizamuddin Aliya or uh, Sheikh Khwaja Muhyiddin Chishti in Ajmer, they would sit and talk about Islam. They would talk about the human, human ex aspect of it. For every Sufi, if you've read their quotes, for them it was service. They were never bothered about who is a Muslim or who is not a Muslim. It was always, you know, like be as generous as the earth. That is what Khwaja Mohinuddin Chishti said. So that was what was the essence of Islam for them. And uh, they served people irrespective of anything and they talked about it also. So, and uh, it, uh, I don't think today there is, as Salman Sabe said, any one person who can speak for us. Uh, but unfortunately, the, the, in the modern world, uh, there are people who jump up and, and say, claim to be speaking in the name of Islam, including some pretty horrible people. You know, I mean, when you have the Islamic State, it calls itself Islamic because it's pretending to represent Muslims. They are you the know. most un-Islamic. Well, it's interesting that, uh, interesting, I'm not sure that uh, uh, I could be corrected on this, but we've never heard uh, even, a, even a contested version of what Islam is, except uh, uh, telling people, well, if you don't follow us, we'll just shoot you in the head. But uh, that's frankly um, everything but not Islam. I mean, I think one can categorically say that Islam is a wondrous, wondrous religion. There are many things in Islam, but what we see in the name of Islam today in the world by people who have, who have uh, resorted to violence against themselves, against Muslims too. These are people not against uh, other religions alone, but against Muslims as well. And I think there is a, uh, that's, that's a total rejection of Islam, if at all it's anything.
Well, I think a lot, a lot of these organizations have, they're more uh, like death cults, actually, than yep. ha that could be virtually any, for sure. any, any ideology, but they're about suicide, really. I mean, they have more to do with suicide and the desire to do something spectacular than to, to any, any faith. But Zulfikar, what do you think about the question of who represents Islam, who should speak for, 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 for Islam? Well, I, th I think it's a vexed question because, um, I mean, I think one should separate out uh, political uh, questions uh, from, uh, if, if at all possible, from questions of, uh, of uh, existential, deep existential questions. I'll give two examples from my classroom, which I always like giving because um, they may resonate with people here. I do think, and one, is, one has got to do with um, some very modern issues that Muslims are facing. Questions of new technologies, in medicine, in science, in, uh, in, in, in questions of looking out at, at the stars. Um, you know, in the 19th century when the camera was first invented and Muslims found themselves, and you might know this from, from your living in Egypt, um, the, the Muslims were vexed by this issue about whether the camera is actually going to produce images that are, um, are man-made or not. And if they were going to be man-made, there were some Muslims um, who contested the use of the camera because they said that only God can produce images of men. Well, you all have cell phones, and you're not asking that question <laughs> anymore, right? Uh, you're all walking around taking selfies. Um, and the reason why, maybe, is because they resolved that question by looking deep into the into the, into the ways in which Muslims have thought about this issue, and they came up with a very ingenious solution. They said, in fact, that by pointing a camera at something, and those, in those times, you've got to remember those large format cameras, it wasn't the human being who was taking the picture. It was the sun which was taking the picture, and they actually called them sun pictures in Arabic, Nazar um, al-Shams, um, because that was a way in which to resolve this deeply philosophical issue or re religious question that they had in their mind that, in fact, um, you know, human beings couldn't deal with that. Now, I think we can all find this quite bizarre, but that was a real question. Now, we're coming up against more complex questions. Um, and I think that those questions about you know, artificial intelligence, about how we think about uh, quasars and black holes, and I mean, these are real things that we as human beings are all going to have to face. And Muslims, like everybody else, are asking questions about, well, you know, what's going to happen if I donate my, my body to science? How, what is going to, do I, do I, I mean, these are not questions that are not human. Um, and then there's the more sort of everyday issues. Um, I had a student in my class, a woman, a wonderfully bright, intelligent woman. She was totally stressed out. And she came to my office and she said, you know, I need to ask you a question. I want to become a boxer. But my parents said that you need to give me a fatwa for me to, allow, for me to become a boxer because Muslim women cannot become Muslim boxers. And I said, well, first of all, I do not have the ability to do that. I'm not qualified in any way to do that. I'm simply a historian, anthropologist, trained in the Western secular tradition. Um, and so I shouldn't uh, at all even you know, suggest that I have any. But I said, this is obviously something that um, I feel, felt a lot of empathy for that these are real things that uh, we are facing. And so when we ask questions about who has the authority, it might be easy for us to say that, oh, you need to make up your mind, or, or go and find the internet um, person, the, the mullah or the uh, person who's going to give you that answer. But um, I, I think that it's uh, more complex than that. And I, I shouldn't like to say that there is any one authority. But I think what's interesting is that People are, Muslims are genuinely wanting to do good in the world, genuinely wanting to find the answer that makes sense within the context of their faith. And I think that um, as people who work on this subject, uh, that, that's something that we need to build empathy for and not sort of say, well, oh, just go figure it out um, or go to the internet. I think that, I think we have to come up with uh, other ways of imagining the discussion and I think that that discourse I was talking about earlier, that treasure that's, that we have 1,400 years of, might provide some um, motivation, some inspiration. Well, I think for the particular question of, of uh, female boxers, we don't need to go to the internet. We can go to Bollywood, and there's a very good film about it called Dangal, which has, has sort of resolved this question of whether women should be boxers or not. Um, and it's interesting, you know, in, 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 uh, in making up the, um, you know, trying to decide on some of these issues, in Saudi Arabia, when they introduced television, 
uh, there was a there the there was a, a lot of the um, religious clergy was dead set against television until it was pointed out that the Friday sermon could be put on television and reach millions of people and suddenly it was like yes that's 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 fine well i think um, uh, you might, uh, might take a vote that the, the Jaipur Literary Festival could be the authoritative version. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are people, uh, I just, uh, uh, you know, I, my, my wife works on, on legal questions and images and so on. And one of the things she mentioned to me, she sent me a, you know, she said, look at this, I found this whole discussion about whether or not on your phone you can use emoticons. Um, and this is being hotly debated in some Muslim context. So, you know, these are, uh, you would see things that are sort of silly or benign, but they're actually real, and people have to go through that process of imagining themselves um, in, this, uh, in this discussion. And why are people having these discussions? Um, yeah. I just wanted to talk, touch very, before we open up to the audience, just touch briefly on one little, uh, uh, one of these kind of d uh, zones of debate that's been very hot in, in India just the last few, few weeks, and, and uh, particularly since uh, uh, Sal Salman has written a book about it, and Rana has also uh, commented on it quite widely, which is the question of triple, triple talaq, um, in the context of who speaks for Muslims and the way the government has sort of represented the, the, the will of Muslims. How, 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 what's, what, what's your quick take on, on the triple talaq issue? Uh, if you can reduce your book to well, <laughs> two uh, minutes. Well, reduce of, the book to one sentence. Yes. <laughs> um, we have a discussion on this tomorrow sometime. Um, but it's, it's quite simple. I think triple talaq itself is uh, a completely misunderstood concept. Uh, there is an explanation of what uh, three times in a lifetime talaq means. But that's not to discuss right now. Point is that the Supreme Court, after considerable effort, having looked at the, the concepts, came to a conclusion in a confused kind of way because judges said different things, but came to a conclusion that there is no triple talaq in India. And that's the end. Now, it's very difficult to understand that the government should want to bring legislation saying there's no triple talaq in India when triple talaq has already been outlawed by, by the Supreme Court. Now, can you be punished for something that doesn't exist? This is a new concept in jurisprudence that I've come across, that you are punished for something that doesn't exist. So if a Hindu gentleman says, I, I give you talaq, I give you talaq, I give you talaq, and he said triple talaq, would he be punished equally as a Muslim gentleman would be? Because both saying triple talaq amount to nothing. So can you be punished for nothing is what I believe is a strange thing. Rana, do you have a... Do you have a, a, yeah, a, a, a I agree point? with Salman Sab, it's exactly that. And uh, since uh, triple talaq, that is instant triple talaq, because uh, given in one go, has already, is already null and void as far as the Supreme Court is concerned. They have given the judgment. So if a man says it to a wife and he's sent to jail, now this lady is, need, is not divorced because the triple talaq doesn't work. So she's not free to marry. Islam encourages remarriage. She's not free to marriage after her iddat of three months or whatever it is. She is now in limbo. She doesn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. Husband's in jail, so who's going to support her? So I don't agree with the punishment of this thing, but yes, I've, we fought very vigorously for it to be declared null and void. We, th that uh, instant triple talaq of saying, uh, or by SMS or email and saying, you know, divorcing your wife in one go, that concept is absolutely wrong and had to go and it has gone. Super. Well, I think we'll open up now to, to questions from the audience. And I see there's a gentleman in the back there in the brown. Yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. Great. I hope that the mic will make it to you through this mob. It's getting there. There we go. I have two short questions. First thing, you know, there has been uh, continuous. Could, could you sp speak up a little bit or hold the mic? Yeah. For the last 1400 years, ever since, you know, Islam came into this world, there had been a bloody feud between. Uh, Shias and Sunnis, and I wish it ends because millions of lives have been lost. Is there any effort being made by any agency, any organization, any person in the world right now to bring both these together, or at least they don't fight like that? Another one is very simple, apostasy. It is, on one hand, we say Quran allows freedom of thought, but here, uh, here or belief also. But here, in case you change your religion, immediately you are killed in Pakistan. You may be aware, you know, it's a death sentence for apostasy. I don't know about, but I know about Pakistan. It is death sentence. So what have you to say about that? Thank you. Excellent questions. And those are actually quite tough questions. So I think we'll, we'll just stick with that one question, not get several at the same time. But would anyone, uh, Zulfikar, would you like to plunge in with those two quite tough questions? 
Oh, yes. Uh, I think um, in terms of your first issue about Sunnis and Shias, I think that it's, uh, as a historian, uh, there are, uh, I, I would take the example of, for example, um, Jafar Sadiq, um, who was, a, you know, a ninth century figure, uh, descendant of the prophet, uh, and he was a teacher. His family is made up of both what we would constitute today as Sunnis and Shias. And he's revered by both Sunnis and Shias as an alim, a scholar, and by the Shia as an imam. And I think that uh, this, uh, this conception that Sunnis and Shias have been at war is uh, not true in all periods. Uh, there is an interesting and uh, resplendent set of discourses between communities of interpretation that um, have been in sometimes mischaracterized as being, as being slightly uh, um, an, um, antagonistic toward one another. I think, again, I would come back to this question of the politicization of these debates in the contemporary period. And um, I would uh, encourage people to reread those histories where you actually see people engaging with one another over complex issues. And I wouldn't want to um, paint all of 1400 years of history as ones of antagonism. Um, some of these are very recent com conversations and, and de debates, and they are held within the context of uh, contemporary politics, which is not a necessarily a, a good indicator of the past. Uh, so I think we should be cautious when we make such blanket uh, statements. Um, uh, not that you were doing that, per se, per se but it, it tends to be an easy way to characterize the contemporary situation. So that's what I would say to that question. Yeah. Uh, and I think there's a second part to the question as well um, about uh, uh, the freedom to leave Islam. Is that, is that a touchy issue? Salman, would you, would you have any, any comment on that? I mean, that's a, that is a problem. Well, I, uh, uh, you seem to have a concern about how some countries treat uh, their citizens and, and the manner in which they take decisions. Now, I would imagine that if you start worrying about other countries, there are many countries in which you can worry about a lot of things. Let's think about our country. This is nothing that's ever been, even when this country had Muslim rulers. This is not something that was ever put to test. This is not something that's ever been taken as a serious concern in our country. And certainly, the constitutional rights that are provided in our country apply equally to everybody. So I would imagine that if you're thinking of ourselves, it's a question that doesn't have any, 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 uh, any substance. As of Shias and Sunnis being united, I think uh, India is a great example of Shias and Sunnis living together very happily. There have been differences from time to time, but please come to Lucknow, please come to my state of Uttar Pradesh, and you'll see how beautifully Shias and Sunnis live together. Sunnis also participate in, pro in processions of Tazias, and Tazias are processions where Shias have a special memory that they want to, they, they want to celebrate. And therefore, if you're looking for examples of how Shia Sunnis can be together, it's here in India, as indeed, if you want to see Hindus and Muslims together, it's here in India. I think that that's... Question just here? Randa, do you have something to add on, on, the, on this question? I think uh, Salman Sabah said it all. We, uh, in India, we have all been living very peacefully, whether it's Shias or Sunnis, and there have been so many intermarriages. There are so many historic intermarriages of Shias and Sunnis, as well as Shias participating in Sunni... Uh, 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 of course, uh, the only thing is the Muharram procession, which is very unique to the Shias, and the Sunnis have been participating. They take out the Taziyas. In fact, more Taziyas are taken out by the Sunnis than by the Shias themselves. Thanks. I, I see there's a, there's a lady there in the, yeah, just on the side over there. And then we'll, we'll come to this gentleman yeah, afterwards. I had a question about, um, to all of you about, do you think, I mean, is there any threat of kind of Wahhabi kind of thinking creeping into Indian uh, Muslim world and in any way shaking up the stability and the, you know, and the um, cohesion that we have in, uh, in Indian Muslims and, you know, just, uh, I think the whole, uh, I think we have like, um, I would say, sort of almost an ideal version of Islam in India. And do you think it could be shaken up by this kind of Wahhabi thinking that's going around elsewhere? Did, you, did you catch it? Please do. Yeah, yeah. well, it's, uh, if you look at Indian history, 
and the history of uh, Muslims in India, uh, every time uh, they've got involved in any, any international uh, movement, uh, it's along with the rest of Indians. Uh, Muslims didn't participate alone in Palestine. Muslims didn't participate alone in, uh, in the uh, Khilafat movement. Muslims uh, didn't participate alone in supporting of Saddam Hussein when Saddam Hussein was uh, attacked by the Americans. Indian Muslims and Indian non-Muslims, Hindus, Sikhs, Jains, everybody, have been united on all issues, on all issues of international concern about Islam. Now, as far as Wahhabism is concerned, a country, a country that has a remarkably rich culture of Sufism and uh, Bhakti movement coming together, and you all have to, you all have to reflect a little bit on, on Sant Kabir. Do you know that Sant Kabir lies not buried, not cremated, but he, he, he lies in, in Magar, a place in Uttar Pradesh, far away from Varanasi, where 20 feet apart, there is a grave and there's a samadhi. Now, wherever you have a country that, that uh, revolves around ideas of the kind that Sant Kabir gave to us, I don't think Wahhabism has a ghost of a chance of finding roots. Thank you. Another question over here. Okay. Hello, sir. Uh, hello to everyone sitting over there. I'm a student of history. I, I read history and I've been through the whole history of Islam, how it rose and all. Uh, so you said that, you know, there are many people these days who jump up to a conclusion about Islam and tries to preach it, to which ma'am said that they are the most un-Islamic people. Many people applauded here. I would like to draw a logical fallacy that I saw in this discussion because just a couple of minutes ago, someone asked who speaks for Islam, to which ma'am said that no one should try to speak for Islam. So, ma'am, when you say uh, that... Uh, yeah. No, I but didn't say please. nobody should sp speak for Islam. I said we should all reflect, reflect within back. ourselves. All right. So you have an idea what Islam should be like, okay? You, you have an idea where, do we, where we are progressing. My question is, this is, this is a line of thought which I see in all the religions. So if you point out that Manusmita, the, the Hindus of these days would say that, okay, now that's selective reading. That's a wrong interpretation. Usko side kar do. This is not what Hinduism is. If you read the Old Testament, some people would say that that's not the, the whole obnoxious uh, notion of God that is being portrayed by the Old Testament. People say that, no, that's not true Christianity. So people have this idea of what a true religion should be like. They have an idea of what progress in religion means, you know. So when we all have an idea what a religion should be like, we choose some verses in Quran and say this is good and choose some verses in Quran and say this, is, this should not be followed. If we agree that morality is something which doesn't come from religion, why should we look for legitimacy from some God and from some prophet? Uh, please ma'am, I want ma'am to answer that. Why should we look, look up to Allah or look up to Prophet and, and gain legitimacy from, from that? Uh, that's your personal choice. If I want to look up to Allah, my constitution guarantees me the right that I can. But if you don't, the constitution guarantees you the right not to either. So that is your personal choice. You cannot force that choice onto anybody. Yes. Th thank you. Okay. Yes. Why? Right. That's okay. your belief? That is what the faith is all about? That is what my faith tells me? And if your faith tells you that there is no God, that's your choice and you are right? Yeah. If the prophet was wrong, I don't think he would have been the prophet. We, the prophet is, uh, that is the belief and that is why we follow Islam, because we feel that what he has done is right. Thank you. I think we're, we're getting off onto a slightly philosophical tangent that could keep us all year, not just uh, for the rest of the evening. So I think we should move on to, to another question. Right here in the front, please. Yeah, yeah. Um, so my question is to all of you, like, uh, you know, Islam or the Muslim community has been stigmatized as the community which spreads terror, but the facts are totally different with this stigma, this uh, particular uh, notion. The facts are totally different. So why is the first place the Muslim community or the Islam as a religion has been uh, like, you know, um, considered as a religion which, you know, spreads terror? Why at the first place? When the reality is totally different. Z Zulfikar, would you like to answer that? Well, I think there are different, um, different answers to your question. It depends how you imagine it. For example, where I live in the West, there's a lot of discussion about how the conception of Muslims is actually was uh, the, 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 the way in which Islam was viewed um, was defined very specifically by Western eyes, especially in the context of colonialism, where you had uh, 
a wholly other community in which you could actually frame uh, as not like you, less civilized. And so there is this whole discussion. You may know the works of Edward Said, a very famous uh, who read a book called The Orientalism, in which he describes the way in which Muslims, the Middle East, and anybody associated with the Middle East that was not European was perceived, right? I think that that is, a, that is an important legacy to be able to understand in order to answer your question, which is a very complex question. I think the other, the other issues have to do with the way in which um, contemporary communities hold that legacy. And let me give you a very simple example. In my university, right, or in, in most Western universities, there will be, in a history department, for example, 17 or 20 people focused on the life of and, and worlds of the British queens and kings, right? For a very short period of time, maybe, you know, 200, 300 years, you'll find thousands of people who have studied that subject. And then you have me. And I have to know 1,400 years of history. I have to know all the different ways of thinking about Islam. I have to know all the you know, hundreds of languages. Muslim, and somehow, I have to be able to talk and teach about that history. So these structural imbalances go towards a kind of um, uh, not, not willful ignorance, I would say. But you know, I can only teach so many people. So the perpetuation of certain stereotypes, certain ways of thinking about Muslims, um, is not corrected in higher education. And it filters through into popular ideas about Islam. And then you don't have very many people who can correct the record. So these are some ways in which you, know, you might want to think about as you become this fantastic business person that you're going to become, or you know, tech you know, billionaire, fund universities, higher education <laughs> institutions, which can actually hire people to, to actually correct the record. And that would actually go a long way towards correcting the misperceptions that you've already pointed out. Thanks. That's a, and I think we can probably have time for just one last question. Yeah. Just this, this fellow in the front here, yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, Saudi plays an important role on, in radicalization of Muslims across the globe. It's a fact. Okay. So the very good example of it is Boko Haram, which has rooted itself in Africa, which is mainly fighting against the French and European countries' interference in Nigeria. So now looking at the map, Europe lies not to the Africa. But the word Boko Haram means that Western civilization is Haram. Okay. So now who gave this idea? Certainly someone from the East, and that must be Saudi Arabia. Okay. But no one is questioning the role of Saudi Arabia in the uh, violence across the globe. Now my question is, Saudi is using Islam as weapon to become superpower. Why are Muslims across the globe are giving Saudi the authority to capitalize Islam for the world, for their world political gains? Who would like to take that? Well, so, I, someone, you, uh, you, you're, I, you're the I'm diplomat. I'm not quite sure that uh, one, as could well as the lawyer. one could agree with your thesis, because even little Qatar doesn't accept Saudi Arabia. Uh, and, uh, and, and much in Saudi Arabia doesn't agree with Saudi Arabia. And Iran doesn't agree with Saudi Arabia. So uh, it's... Uh, and then, uh, as it appears, much of Saudi Arabia doesn't, doesn't agree with the establishment in Saudi Arabia. So these are evolving, these are evolving situations. But frankly, just uh, going back to the last question, you seem to know a lot about Osama bin Laden, but you know very little about Badshah Khan, Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan. Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan turned a violent tribes, tribes of Afghanistan into peaceniks. And he was therefore called called the, uh, the second Mahatma Gandhi, Badshah Khan. So therefore, let us look at those models that teach us the best there is in Islam and the culture of South Asia, rather than look at models that are crazy models from the West. I think that's the answer. Thank you, Salman. I think, and I think that's, our time is up now. So uh, thank you very much. You've been a wonderful audience. And thanks to the panelists. That's been super. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so, so, so much to our brilliant panelists and to the Institute of Ismaili Studies and, uh, and Aga Khan Foundation for the, that fascinating session. I would ask you to please